Now we're on. So I'm going to get rid of this because we've all seen it and you've probably all written it down for future reference. And we'll get on with this. Um, this session is about retouching. That doesn't all mean high fashion retouching. It means getting rid of problems in photos as well. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say this guy has any problems at all, but we're going to reduce his wrinkles somewhat. We're not going to get rid of them because that would just look silly. We're going to reduce them. Hopefully that won't look quite so silly. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a copy of this layer. Now there's ten ways of doing everything in Photoshop. The easiest way to make a copy of a layer is just to go Command or Control J. And that's the quickest way to make a copy. If you have a selection, it will copy the selection to a new layer. If you don't have a selection, it just copies the entire layer. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit um, and get the Healing Brush tool. Healing Brush tool and the Clone Stamp tool work kind of hand in hand. The Clone Stamp tool makes an exact copy of part of an image. It's great for adding a third eye in the middle of someone's forehead. The Healing Brush tool doesn't work in quite the same way. It uses the source point purely for the texture. And then when you paint a blob to sort of fix it, it uses the edge of that blob for the source of the color that it's going to use to fix the result. So if I fix a brush size here, first of all, um, a hard edge brush is fine with a healing tool. With a clone stamp tool, you've got to use a soft edge brush. Because it's making an exact copy, um, you don't want the edges of what you're doing to be visible. With a healing brush tool, that's not a problem in the same way. So you hold down the Alt key and click in order to define the source point. Another difference with the Clone Stamp tool is whenever you stop working, uh, you have to sort of res you want to reset the source point often. Otherwise, you get repeating patterns and other problems. With a healing brush tool, you don't need to worry about that. Every time you let go, the source point returns to where it was originally. If you've got aligned off, <coughs> Oscar, <coughs> sorry. We just use, this is Oscar's computer. He's very kindly loaned me this piece of, uh, sorry, this computer <laughs> this, after, uh, this evening <laughs> because he didn't know how to make my PC work with the projector, but I'll forgive him. I've changed so many things on this now. <laughs> it's going to be like an alien, an alien device when you get back to it. I've changed preferences. I've changed how some of the tools work. It's going to be a real interesting day for you tomorrow. <laughs> So, okay, so you can see I'm gradually smoothing out this guy. Now, at this point, I've got a fairly large area here. I'm going to turn him into a burn victim fairly quickly. That's apparent. Um, it's unfortunate, but actually this is going to help because, well, you'll see what I'm going to do in a minute. Uh, I'm really just smoothing out everything that I can. Now, with the healing brush tool, you have to be really careful not to go over the edge into areas that you don't want to work with. For instance, if I start to work over here and I run over the edge, I'm just going to do it so you can see what happens. You see that? Bad result because the blob that I painted, the color around the edge of it is being used to fix it. So I'm just going to undo that. And I'm really getting rid of an awful lot of detail here. Do you think his mother would know him? Uh, one of the people I had in class doing this a while ago decided at the end of one of these, uh, which is quite impressive, uh, she decided she'd run him through it again, and then again, and then again, and the result was really weird. Uh, just totally strange. This is already totally strange, so I'm going to stop now. Now I'm going to create a mask. Now, if to create a mask, you just click on this icon at the bottom of the layers window. That's a mask. The purpose of the mask is to allow opacity changes, which you can see through. And a lot of people have trouble using masks. They're actually very, very easy and straightforward. Um, really easy because all you've got to do to remember which way around the thing is, is to make a mask. So I've got a mask here. It's white. Can I see through it? No. So white means you can't see through it. If I paint it on that in black, you could see through it. And I'll do that. That's the layer underneath showing through. I just painted that streak on the mask and you can see through to the layer underneath. But I'm going to undo that as well. 
If I paint on the mask with a gradient, I will have all kinds of different levels of opacity going from totally opaque to totally transparent. So that's a very useful way of using masks. You can put one image on top of another, put a mask on the top layer, paint a gradient on it, and you can see half of one image fading through to half of the other image. It's a really good method. Here I'm going to do something slightly different. If I click on the image, and I'm just going to put a color here in the toolbox so you can see. When the image is selected, and you can see the frame around it, you can paint on the image in color, no problem. If I select the mask, the colors at the bottom of the toolbox revert to grayscale because the mask only supports degrees of opacity, and those are generated using shades of gray. Now if I click back on the image again and then go to the channels window, we can have a look at the individual channels. There's the blue channel. There's the green channel. There's the red channel. The red channel is the lightest, probably the smoothest of the three. If I use this one as a mask, the shades of gray result in partial opacity through to the layer behind. If I use the blue channel, that one's too dark, and also it's not very even. The green channel is slightly better, but the red channel is probably the best. Now I'm going to select all of that with Command A. That's select all. That gives me the entire thing. And now if I do Command C, that has copied that channel into memory. Now I'm going to go back to the composite channel, go back to the layers window. If you want to load a mask as the visible image from the layers window, you Alt click on it. And that gives you the mask as the visible image. Otherwise, it's very difficult to do. And I'm going to paste straight into it. So I've loaded the red channel into the mask. Now I'm going to click on the image again and deselect. And I'm done. Can you tell? If I turn this layer on and off, that's before and that's after. Now that's a pretty strange technique, but it's very, very effective we have substantially reduced the wrinkles on the guy's face. So this is one of those techniques that I call the invention of the bagel. Because inventing a bagel is so unlikely. <coughs> one day somebody had some bread dough, and they, it was extra, they didn't know what to do with it, and they thought, I know, I'll boil it, and then I'll bake it. How likely is that? And that's how we get bagels, you boil the dough first. I, I kind of thought it was like maybe married, not married. Married? Not married. <laughs> uh, what, like a bagel? What? Um, okay, we'll have to have a chat about how bagels relate to marriage. But anyway, so there you go. That's <laughs> now you see it, now you don't. So that's example one. Okay, you're moving on from that. Example two. I love this one because I have to work with this person occasionally. Uh, I can't tell you who he is, because he'd sue me. <clears throat> and he'd also sue me for showing you this stuff. Um, he's the chairman of a, a freelance company who I do some work with occasionally. I like to do freelance work as well as the academy class stuff, because doing freelance work keeps me sharp for what I'm training. And especially if I'm training print-related stuff. I still do printing all over the place, all over the world. And if I didn't, I would start to get rusty about the print stuff that I'm trying to teach people at academy class, so it really helps. And as I have a week on and a week off, there's no problem. I'm saying that because Mark is sitting right next to me. So, when I get uh, a photo of this guy from the team that work with him, usually there are three requests. First is reduce the bags under his eyes. Don't not get rid of them completely, but reduce them. The second is brighten his teeth a little bit. And third is he'd like to lose about 20 pounds. <laughs> that one's actually the easiest. No, it's right nice. No, we'll keep that. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, the color's a little strong on screen. It's on the monitor, it's not quite that pronounced. He does have a bit of a red nose, doesn't he? We're going to get onto red faces a bit later. Okay, so again, I'm going to make uh, a new layer. It's usually a good idea to just make a contingency plan layer anyway, because if everything goes wrong, you've got to fall back really easily. But in this case, I actually need it. And then I'm going to zoom in. And again, I'm going to use this 
great tool, the healing brush, um, which requires a source point. So I'm going to source right in the middle of his forehead because that's more or less smooth. And I'll get a slightly bigger brush. Now that's good. And I'm just going to wipe out the bag under his eye there and this one. Now that looks totally, totally strange, doesn't it? Yeah, he wouldn't thank me for this. However, if I reduce this one in opacity, this one beneath it is going to show through, and I don't want it to show through at full strength. I just want it to show through partially, like that. So now he's still got the bags under his eyes, but hey, they're a heck of a lot better than they used to be. So I could get away with that. Now I'm going to merge the layers. Command E is merge down. That's a keyboard shortcut for merge down. Your selected layer merges with the one below it. Again, very useful. I like keyboard shortcuts because they mean I can spend more time in the garden. Um, my wife and I figured out that this shortcut for zoom, which is you hold down command and spacebar and then you click and drag to zoom in, probably saves me close to a working day a year. Okay? That's one shortcut. It works in InDesign and Illustrator as well, so I'm not just using it in Photoshop. But that's a lot of time saved by using a shortcut. If you don't use shortcuts, well, too bad. Um, anyway, now I've done the bags under his eyes, now I'm going to focus on his teeth. <laughs> too bad. There we go. Uh, for this one, I'm going to switch to the freehand lasso tool, and I'm going to make a selection just loosely around his mouth. And I'm not getting too close to anything. I mean, why would you want to? Like that. Um, you may notice I'm not using a mouse, I'm using a pen. And really, I recommend this to people. <clears throat> if you don't have one of these, and you want a career using a computer, you really should get one. Because if you don't, one finger doing all the wagging on a mouse, you're going to get repetitive stress injury. And when you get it, you have to stop what you're doing or it won't get better. I've never yet met someone who got repetitive stress injury from using a pen because it uses your whole hand. I did run into one guy who said he'd hurt himself with a pen, but when I pressed, he said he'd stuck it in his eye, which doesn't count. You can get these off eBay. This one, I looked the other day, they're there for $37.99 free shipping. Okay? That's just ridiculously cheap considering you can save your career with it. They're really worth it. And I don't own shares in this company. It's called a Wacom, W-A-C-O-M. And this is a bamboo. This is like the, the lowest end model they make. For me, it's perfect. It's, it's really accurate. Uh, it's small. It fits into my bag. I can take it anywhere. I can lean back in a chair armchair or work on the train it's great they're really really effective so you've got to get one well, who's, who's the only authorized Wacom train center in the UK yet? oddly enough <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't sell it we don't sell it we don't, we make don't sell it. So but we, we use them in class we do we've got uh, we've got quite a few of the tablets we actually use in class anyone who comes to a class can try one they take a bit of getting used to but if you're using it sort of in the same mode as a mouse which I don't, but you know you can. They're really easy to, to get to grips with quickly. And they're great. They're pressure sensitive, which a mouse isn't. So in Photoshop, they're a gift. If you press a little harder when you're using a paintbrush, the brush stroke gets bigger. So they're just great. They're really, really good tools. So they're more accurate. I mean, try signing a name with a pen, then sign your name with a mouse. Yeah? I don't really need to say any more about that. So they're really accurate, and they're going to save your career. That's that's worth it. Okay, so I've got a selection of his teeth, and I'm going to use Refine Edge. Anytime you've got a selection, you have this button available on the Options bar. In CS4, it's underneath the Select menu. It's still there, but you can get it on the Options bar now. And the Refine Edge window, which is truly useful, uh, you've got a feather slider, and I'm just going to feather that a little bit and OK it. So now I've got a soft edge selection of his teeth. So if I now do Command-J, I've captured his teeth on a separate layer, which means I can work on them without affecting anything else. 
And in order to clean them, rather than using something like levels or curves, I'm going to use a brush to clean them, because <laughs> we all toothbrush, right? <coughs> so we got a blur tool uh, smudge here. Here we go. Um, the dodge tool can be used to make something lighter. The blur tool, the burn tool, sorry, can be used to make something darker. These are three tools that used to be used in dark rooms. Maybe they still are, but not many people use dark rooms anymore. I used to. The fumes made me really cranky. I'd come home, my wife would say, okay, go sit over there, you know. You're in a bad mood. Um, the dodge tool was a piece of cardboard stuck to the top of a pencil. When you were making an exposure, you'd waggle it in the beam of light, and it would restrict light from hitting part of the print. And waggling it meant you didn't get a defined edge. So you get a brighter spot on the print. The burn tool was your hands, and you'd let the light through, and again, you'd move your hands around in the beam, so it didn't create a fixed image. And you'd allow more light through for more exposure and a darker part of the print. Uh, the sponge was used if you were making what are called cibachrome prints, which are a color print, early kind of color print. Um, and unfortunately, you could leach color out of the color print, but you had to use cyanide. So, you know, you'd, you'd get the good result, and then you'd fall over dead. Uh, unfortunate. Here we're going to use the burn tool, because I want to, uh, sorry, the dodge tool. <laughs> I'm about to make his teeth darker. Um, I'm changing the brush size here by tapping on the bracket keys to the right of the letter P. You can go up here and use these sliders, but really it's a waste of time. You might as well use the bracket keys, because they're right here, and that's another keyboard shortcut. If you want to make the brush harder or softer, you hold down the shift key, tap on the right hand bracket key, you make the brush harder, see that icon? Tap on the left hand key, you make it softer. I want a soft edge brush here, and 15 is plenty, no, maybe 20. You can choose whether to affect the shadows, the midtones, or the highlights. I'm going to go for highlights. And the exposure, I'm going to cut that down to 10. The default setting is 50%. It's way too strong. You'll burn his teeth out straight away. We call that a California bleach job. You don't want that. Now I can just start working on his teeth a little bit. And it's quite <coughs> subtle, but if I turn that on and off, you can see what I just did. So it works quickly and effectively, and I'll zoom out again. If I thought I'd overdone that, I could turn the opacity down. So I've got all kinds of options. Sometimes it's a good idea to overdo it and then use the opacity to back off on it a little bit. I'm going to merge that down as well. Okay, the last thing I mentioned is he wants to lose about 20 pounds. And it's the easiest of all, and it's kind of silly, but it works. I'll make a copy of the layer, Command-J, and then I'll get the Transform tool, that's Command-T, that's Free Transform, and it puts a frame around the whole image. And all I'm going to do is grab the right-hand handle and do that. That's all you need to do. And that will make him feel much better about himself. <laughs> so we've just done that to that. Silly, but it works. There's no need to spend a whole lot of time if you can do it quickly and easily, right? So that does it quickly and easily. And especially if you're dealing with a head and shoulders shot, you don't have to worry about arms and legs and so on. You can just do it like that. So that finishes off that one. Okay, next, what am I going to do next? Oh, yeah. Um, some retouching things are fairly straightforward, like red eye. It's very common, very easy to get red eye. If somebody is looking too close towards a flash when it goes off, they'll get red eye. And in Photoshop, it's really easy to fix. I'm not going to spend much time on this. And this is the image that I use for it. I love that shot. Uh, she doesn't actually have teeth like that. <laughs> yeah, um, I couldn't resist. You know, it had to happen. Uh, so we've got a really nice red eye here. Now the red eye brush is at the bottom of the flyout for the healing brush tool. There it is, the red eye tool. You've got some adjustment up here on the options bar. Um, I've never changed those. I've never needed to change those. Did you ever change those? 
<laughs> yeah, you did. You're not being very committal about that. Okay. So all you have to do when you've you've got that brush, you just click on the red bits. That's it. How easy is that? Yeah. If you've got you know the green laser beams of death, that's a different problem. You, that's much harder to fix. But red eye is dead easy. A much more difficult problem to fix is red faces. And I've got a couple of examples of that. That's not actually a face. You may be able to tell. That's a shallot, uh, grown by my own fair hands in Wales. And in the channels window, I've made a selection of that. I've, I cooked this one up deliberately. Shallots aren't usually that color. But I made a selection, and then I clicked on this icon here, which is Save Selection as Channel. And that gives me this Alpha 1 channel. And in order to load a selection, all you have to do is hold down the Command key and click on the channel. And that loads the selection straight away. Now, this is something that I'm constantly amazed by. In my Photoshop classes, and I said this just yesterday, I always say to people, okay, you're not going to remember this one, and you'll kick yourselves because we're going to be using it a lot. If you want to load a channel, a load a channel as a selection, you, contr you control or command click on it. If you've got a layer, and I'm just going to delete this selection, and I'll make, there we go, a rectangle, and Alt Backspace fills a selection with color, it's a very good shortcut. Alt backspace fills it with a foreground color. Command or control backspace fills it with a background color. If you've got a selection, it fills the selection. If you don't have a selection, it fills the whole layer. If I want to load that as a selection, you hold down the command key and you click on the actual thumbnail, like that. Now, it's incredibly useful, and it's impossible to remember. <coughs> so. Yesterday I went. I did this four or five times. And nobody remembered it, even though I was saying you got to remember this one. Today we we did it again several times. By the end of the day, a couple of people were vaguely remembering it. Everything else they get. This one is hard to remember. You know, if you only get one thing tonight, let it be that thing. Okay, it's incredibly, incredibly useful. I'm going to bin this now. I don't need that. And okay, so back to loading. This is a selection. Come on, click on it. Um, and I'm going to select the layer again. And the idea is you can use the hue and saturation window. Now, there's a couple of places you can find that. It's one of the adjustment layers, if you're familiar with those, or you can get this from under image, adjustment, hue and saturation. Or you can use the shortcut, command U, and that turns it on and off. Wherever something starts on this hue slider, if you drag the slider to the left or the right, it will move through that hue rainbow from its starting point. So red is over here on the left. If I drag the slider slightly to the right, red becomes orange, then yellow, then green, and so on. Yeah. But of course, on the way, it went through the color it started out as, like that. So that's the idea of fixing <coughs> color problems in images, like red faces. You've got to make a selection of the problem area and then use the hue slider. Sometimes you have to do other things too. So, here's a friend of mine, two friends of mine, and I cooked up again red faces. Now if I make a selection, I'll use the freehand lasso tool and I'll just go around his face and I'm going to try not to get too close. Got a little bit close there, so hold down the shift key, add to a little bit. There we go. Uh, now I pulled out that bottom right hand corner to give myself some gray area around the image because the tools are active in the gray area. They can't do anything because there's no image, but they can start there. So if I want the selection of her to come right down to the edge of the image, first I hold down the shift key because that allows me to add to the selection probably see that tiny little plus sign next to the cursor. The Alt key allows me to take away from the selection. So I hold down the Shift key and start down in the gray area and come up through the lace, round her head, through her hair, 
down through the lace again, gut too close there, into the gray area, and the selection goes right to the edge. And I'm just going to extend that a little bit. There we go, like that. So now I've got their faces selected. Back to refine edge, because I don't want the edges to be visible, and feather that a little bit. At the top of the refine edge window, you've got a bunch of different views you can use. And you just pick out whichever one is particularly useful to you at the time. Uh, on white would be good, on layers would be good here. Uh, then I'm just going to click on that arrow again to close it. Um, somewhere around 10 or 12 is good for this kind of feathering. That's the sort of edge you want. Now I click OK and Command J copies that selection to a new layer. So now I've got their faces on this new layer with a fuzzy edge. Which means whatever I do is going to be much less likely to be visible. Now if I just do Command U again and open the Hue and Saturation slider, and I think, okay, well I've got their faces on a new layer, and I'll drag the slider to the right, and their faces work out, but her hair goes green. Not good. So that's not going to do it. I'll put zero back in here. So instead what you can do is choose from the master list the kind of color that you want to affect. And sometimes I'll choose several of these, one after another, in order to do what I need to do to an image. In this case, I want reds. That brackets off a chunk of the sliders down here. You can move those gates, if you want, and extend or contract the area that it's going to affect. This is OK in this case. Now if I drag the hue slider, it's not going to affect her hair at all because her hair is not red. And it just affects their faces. So there's the change. Now obviously this one I cooked it up. Well, and even though the screen's looking a little strong, that's... Okay, that was really bad, wasn't it? Okay. So that's now much better than it was. Uh, I've got a real image here as well. A real image. <laughs> Beach. Now that's pretty much fixed. But I'll turn the. That's what it was originally. That's the original layer. It's kind of, kind of sad. Not really going to do it. So what I did was made a selection <coughs> of the background using the quick selection tool. Now you may have used this. You may not. It's on the same flyout as the magic wand tool. Magic Wand Tool is great, and it uses a tolerance up here in the options bar. The higher that number, the more pixels are going to be selected around where you click. So what that number means is, if I click up here in the sky, it'll select that pixel and anything, oops, wrong layer mark, anything adjacent to it that is six shades lighter or darker than where I clicked. And then you can hold down the shift key and keep on clicking and gradually extend it. That's going to be a little slow here. So I'm not going to bother with that. I'm going to use the quick selection tool instead. There are very few adjustments to this tool. It's a little bit stupid, but it's a great tool. And I can just start clicking and dragging, and it snagged that whole side of the sky there. Alt click and drag through the area I don't really want it to get, and then shift click and drag through the areas that I do want it to get. And you don't have to be desperately picky about this. Uh, I can be quite loose about this, in fact, as you can see. So now I've got that whole kind of beach area and a bit there that I didn't want to select. That'll do. That'll be fine. Now I've got the selection of the background. What I really want is them. So if I inverse that selection and then do Command-J, what I'll get is that on a new layer. And this one, I used variations on it. Let me just load that as a selection. How do I load this layer as a selection? Did anyone remember? Hey, well done. You control click or command click on the thumbnail. You can't click over here. It's got to be on the thumbnail. Now I'm going to back, go back to this layer. And if I do command J, I get a copy of it. And if I go image, adjustments, variations, which you don't have because I'm running in 64-bit. <laughs> okay, well, I should point out, if you run Photoshop on a Mac in 64-bit, did you know it was going to do that? Too? Yeah, thank you. 
variations isn't there, nor are lighting effects and one or two other goodies that you really want. So the moral of this story is don't borrow Oscar's computer. So <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we'll talk about it later. So I'm just going to go straight to this one. Variations is a very good area. You can add a color cast to part of the image or the whole thing and cut a color cast as well. So if the image is too blue, you can reduce the blue by clicking on its opposite. If it's too green, you click on its opposite. Do you know what the opposite of green is? Anybody? No? Magenta. Magenta is the opposite of, of green. Um, I'm gonna, I've got an image I'll show you. I'll load it when we're doing the break and I'll show you after. It's, it's, it's amazing how colors have opposite. So that fixes the, the sort of strong magenta that we had there. And then I decided this needed a bit more contrast, so for that I used curves. For command M, shortcut for curves. Do I know the shortcuts or what? That is also under image adjustments, and I used curves for adding contrast. If you drag the middle point there, up or down, it is just like moving the middle slider in the levels window. So you might as well use levels. But if you put a dot there, and you can put dots all over this line if you want, and the line rotates around the dots. Nice. And you can get rid of dots just by pulling. If I leave that one in the middle and then drag this line into a slight S bend, I add contrast. You see that? This is a much better way of adding contrast than using the brightness and contrast filter. That tends to be a little destructive. This isn't. And there's the result. So I've come from essentially that to that really easily. So that's another kind of retouching. All right. What's the time? What I'd like to do is call the break a little early because the next session is going to be a little longer than half an hour. So if we take our break now, and then I'll load this other image as well, then the next section will be a little, it's a little more strenuous, okay? Cool, yeah, 10, 10, 15-minute break, and then back to your seats. Thank you.